Good morning. My name is David Russell. Uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you guys about what God has done with me uh, through my life. Uh, it's just all about cheerful obedience and having a servant attitude. God, God can use you to do some amazing things. All right. Uh, stay tuned and listen to what i got to say. Thank you very much. Good morning. God is good. Woohoo! All right. Um, just a couple quick announcements. There's sign up sheets, so make sure you use the sign up sheet. And uh, if your name's not on the sign up sheet, just go ahead and add it to the back page, please. Name, email, phone number, and whatever else. Uh, date of birth, serial number, or uh, social security number. And let's see, do we have any, uh, any, did anybody bring a friend today? Anybody bring a friend? All right. Got some friends somewhere. Thank you so much for coming. Good morning, Lowell. All right. And uh, how about sons? Do we have any sons? I know we're all sons, but did anybody bring their sons? Yep. What's your dad's name? Good morning, Joe. All right. And how about some other sons? What's your son's name? You got David. Go ahead. There's two more. Glenn. All right, good morning, Glenn. And then there's, Jerry's got two. What are your boys' names? All right, good morning, boys. Okay, and another one over here. What's his name? David. All right. Okay, well, um, and the one thing I would just encourage you each to do, you know, is to go out and touch someone around you, maybe someone that doesn't know God or maybe somebody that, you know, does know God, but uh, have fallen away, and um, and just be a light to those around you. And so, <clears throat> speaking of that, um, our speaker this morning is uh, David Russell, and um, most of you probably don't know him. He's not a member of this church, and um, but the first time I saw him <clears throat> was probably about a year and a half or two years ago, and his, I think, his head was shaved, and there was a cross spray-painted into the back of it. But I'm not exactly sure, because it all happened so quickly. And I looked at him, and I said, who is this freak? <clears throat> and then, you know, a couple more times later, you know, I met him, and, you know, I looked at him. He's got these earrings in there. You know, he's wearing these earrings. And I said, wow, that's funny. Those kind of look like molars, you know. Where do you buy those, you know? He goes, oh, no, those are mine. You know, what, you, I know they're yours. You know, where do you get them? No, 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 I, I, they came out of my mouth. And uh, anyway, I'm going. Yeah, I use that as a way to, you know, to connect with kids. You know, they'll never forget, you know, the guy with the, you know, teeth earrings, you know. And I thought, wow, that's, yeah, that's probably true, you know. But anyway, you know, every time I see him, he's got a smile. He's encouraging. Um, you know, he's always got a, a, you know, funny thing to say. And there's just always this little aura around him of joy. And I thought, well, here's somebody we need to hear from. So here we go. All right. I'm, I'm the freak. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? So I guess you guys are kind of wondering why Paul's like, hey, David, come on down and talk to us today. You get to follow Sheriff Ivy. There was like 150 people here last month. And I want you guys to know I am wondering the exact same thing. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, let's see. Cheer cheerful obedience is something I have heard since Paul asked me to come up here. And he, he kind of came to me, he's like, all right, David, uh, I want you to come and I want you to talk to these guys at this awesome breakfast with some amazing food and very bright lights in your eyes. Um, and, and I just want you to talk about, you know, whatever you have on your heart. I'm like, all right, so you got some guidelines or, or anything? Well, you, you know, God, God will tell you what you need to say. You just get up there and, and you, just, you just tell them what, what, what God wants you to tell them. All right. Oh, and, and don't, don't talk bad about religions. And don't ask for money. And don't talk about Christo because they, they've all heard about Christo. Real quick, though. Real quick. Show of hands. Who in here has been to Christo? Now, all those hands up, I'll guarantee you they're leaders in their church. They're doing some ministry. Okay, that's it. Done, done with the Christo thing <laughs> for now. Cheerful obedience. Got to listen to the man. So, I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that all of you have heard better preachers than me. 
guys that can quote every scripture in the Bible. You know the addresses, where they are. So I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with my knowledge of the scripture because um, I learned a lot in Sunday school, you know, David and Goliath and all that good stuff. Um, but there's a story I know better than anybody else, and it's my story. So we're, we're going to give that a shot today. Whew, here we go. <clears throat> my story is not a story of success, though. It's not. It's a story of being extremely blessed when, when I didn't deserve to be. I am 33. I'm married to a beautiful wife. She's, uh, she's six foot one, so I look up to her. She's a... Uh, awesome. She really bailed me out of a lot of trouble when I was uh, not being good. I have a beautiful daughter. She is three years old as of uh, two Saturdays ago, and she is wearing six-year-old clothes, so she is very quickly trying to catch up to mom. Um, that's why this arm is so much bigger than this arm, carrying her everywhere. Um, they, they, they keep me grounded. They're awesome. They're, they're my motivation for a lot of things. Uh, thanks, Amanda and Olivia. I love you guys. So I've been going to church since I was born. I cannot remember a time in my life when God was not there. Nobody ever had to introduce me to him. I, I've known him since, since I was way shorter than my daughter. Um, I went to uh, uh, Sunday school every week. We, we'd go and we, we'd help feed people. We'd had a fellowship dinner I'd go to every week and, and wash dishes. I'd get up and I'd sing on Sundays, you know, the children's choir. I was in handbells. We played on the playground. Church was my life. That, that is where I was three to four nights of the week. And my parents were there serving, great servants, awesome examples of what a Christian's supposed to be. And I've luckily been able to follow them my entire life like that. Uh, one, one Sunday, you know, you, you gather all the kids up to the front of the church, and the pastor's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And all the kids are like, I want to be a firefighter. I want, I want to be a policeman. I said I wanted to be a pirate. <laughs> it kind of happened. You'll, you'll hear about some of that later. Um, but not all pirates are bad, you know. I mean, <laughs> My mom was a stay-at-home mom uh, and, and always at church. She used to cook these huge dinners for the church congregation, and they, they were amazing. Fantastic meals. And I got an opportunity to meet lots of people that way. She'd, she'd pull homeless people in off the street and feed them, send them home with extra bags of food, stuff like that. Awesome. My, my dad was in the Navy, um, and we were stationed in Georgia for like three years, and I was born. And then we moved here once he got stationed right back in his hometown. So we actually got to build a house on my grandma's property down on the river. Beautiful, down in Rock Ledge. So a very blessed childhood, you know. I, I never wanted for anything. I used to, like, throw away filet mignon because it had chewy bits in it, you know, never really understanding just how good I had it and, and, until I had more friends later on. Um, the church we attended after that was actually the church my father grew up in as well and my grandma. In fact, some of the land was donated from my grandma at that point. So for about 27 years, I was at this church, and God did some amazing things with me and through me at that church. I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. I got all kind of paperwork up here. This is like my fourth time writing this thing, and every time God's just like, just, just rip it up. It's garbage. Get it out of here. I'm going to tell you what you need to say. But uh, like I said, my childhood years were in Sunday school. They were at church. They were playing together on the playground. The kids at church were my friends. Uh, the only problem with having an extremely blessed childhood uh, and my parents were smart with their money. They, they weren't overly rich or anything, but they were very smart with their money. Um, for, for whatever reason, there weren't a lot of kids in the area I grew up in. I was in kind of the older section of, of Rockledge down on River Road. There, there's not a lot of young families down there at that point. So I have my brother, awesome brother Scott, and, and my cousin Chad, who, who's a Marine now. He's doing good. And then my other cousin Joe. And we hung out every day. We, we'd school, church, hang out in our big forest backyard and play tag or football. Um, but, but yeah, again, the only problem was I really didn't know how to interact with people that weren't either in church or in my family. So that, that was weird. Um, the only, yeah, like I said, the only thing that was really missing was just interacting with kids. Uh, you know, it's good to shelter your kids to a point. You know, they, they need to not be doing drugs at 10, 12, 13, 14 years old. They, they don't need to know about what, what guys and girls do together when they get older. Um, but, but you still have to have interactions with other people your age or else you get to a point when you finally do get outside your, your comfort zone, your, your shelter, that you really don't know how to tell them no or anything like that. Um, so, so in middle school, I got to middle school. In, in elementary school, I was good. No, no name on the board or anything. Went and did my work all the time. Not like, like a straight-A student or anything, but I don't think I ever got a D or anything, so that, that's good. Um, I was short when I got to middle school. I was four foot nine until I was 18 years old. Ooh, big deal, he was short. No, it was, it was rough. I was four foot nine until I was 18 years old. So in middle school, most of the cool people I wanted to hang out with were like, you remind me of my younger brother. Go away, you're annoying me. 
And that's, that's pretty much how middle school went. Uh, again, I was good, no trouble, no detentions, nothing like that. I got to high school, still short, still that little teddy bear, cute little kid. Not cute like the girls want to date me, just cute like the, you know, I'm a teddy bear on there. And anyway, um, I finally met up with a bunch of guys that were, were you know, the, kind of the outcasts of the school like me, and we called ourselves the River Rats because we always were in the river. That, that was the good part about living on the river. I had this huge swimming pool full of manatees and, and manatee poop and jellyfish and stuff. We were in that thing every single day. We loved that water. If we weren't swimming in it, we were kayaking in it. We were out on the island trying not to set the entire thing on fire at once. Oh, well, my, I won't tell you too much about that. I'm on camera. I don't want to go to jail. So, so okay, now, now we get to the negative side, okay? This is the pirate section of my life, right? So I've been, I've been, I've been a player. I've had more than three girlfriends at one time. I'm not proud of it. I, I did it. Um, I, I've, I've dealt drugs before. Uh, not cool, but, but I did. Uh, I used to throw so many parties at houses that I house at for that suddenly I wasn't allowed to house it for too many more people anymore. Sorry about that, guys. That wasn't cool. I, I really do apologize. Um, I've had so many concussions from skateboarding. I can't remember them all, <laughs> but I get told about them quite. Remember the time you fell out the tree on your head? No, the, the other time. No, the other, other time, David. You know, my, my friends are good at reminding me of stuff like that. Um, I've skipped out on so many DUIs. I could have had so many DUIs, but I'm sneaky and I know the back roads. Not proud of it. Just letting you guys know. I'm not a good person. I'm regular and normal. And God still used me. And we're going to show you how he used me here in a second. Um, we used to take a lot of island trips and go, go camping out on the island. Just a big group of guys, you know. And everything we did all the time, we, we'd drink and, 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 we'd, and we'd smoke weed out there and we'd do things we shouldn't do. Sometimes we'd chase other people off the island by running around naked. And for some reason, they didn't want to be on the island with us at that point. <laughs> well, whatever. It was really Lord of the Flies type thing. It's, it's what we did as kids, you know. Luckily, I grew out of all that silliness, as you can tell. So... <laughs> All right. I could really go on for this entire half hour just telling you about the bad things I did, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to glorify what God has done through me and with me. So, on to some of the pluses. Uh, all, the, all these hooligans, all, all my hoodlum friends, our river rat crew, we actually did a lot of good in, in our church, too. Uh, God blessed me with an opportunity to work at a boys and girls club. I had 185 kids every day after school by myself in the middle of the ghetto. Whoa. <laughs> I had never worked with kids before, but man, I'll tell you what, that was an experience. 185 kids. Now, how can a guy who's never, oh, and I was shy too, by the way. I was, I was very shy because I was four foot nine growing up. Um, yeah, I, I was a shy guy, and here I am in charge of 185 unruly kids. Every day after school, I had to give them snack, had to do their homework with them, had to teach them how not to beat each other up when we played basketball, and I had to make sure they all left with their correct parent every day. And that, that was pretty impressive. There's only one way that happened. That's through the power of God. The cool thing is, at the end of the day, we had all these leftover snacks, and I started taking them home with me because I couldn't put them back in, the, in, the, in the, the closet. If I saw a homeless guy on the side of the road, here, have a pudding pack, have some, some chocolate milk, whatever we had in. Well, not chocolate milk. It turned into, like, chocolate cottage cheese in the trunk of the car. <laughs> but, but whatever we had in there, we, we would just give out to people. Eventually, I found out where the food was coming from was Second Harvest Food Bank. If you're involved in a food pantry anywhere, you know who Second Harvest is. Um, they get really cheap food for food banks, which is an awesome ministry. I worked there for a while, and I did some, like, uh, I'd, I'd go out, and I'd, uh, can't, can't find the word right now. I'd look over the food pantries, make sure that they were all, inspector, haha. I was inspecting other food pantries. After a while, I realized, man, this is kind of easy. There's not a whole lot of work to food pantry other than you need some muscles, and you need some people who are dedicated to it. So we started a food pantry at my church, and we were there every Monday and Saturday for... Oh, at least three years, but before it, it turned into just me on Saturdays. And it ended up, at the end, it was seven years. Uh, now, we had support from the church because we started out negative $2,000 in the hole. By the time we were done after seven years, we had $8,000 in the positive in, in, in the account, which that's amazing because most of the church really didn't want us there on account of, like, well, homeless people are they're, they're dangerous and they're scary when we walk out to our cars at night, which is, which is a valid concern if you're a little old lady. You know, I don't know why you're walking out your car at dark by yourself. Somebody should really take you out there. But, but if, you know, you know, if you got food there, it's just like bait. It attracts people. So I, I guess their concerns were valid. So the only real help that I had were the, uh, well, like the crackheads. They'd come and they'd stock my shelves. They'd do three hours of work in five minutes. No problem. <laughs> Done. Those shelves were stocked. Those labels were facing forward. 
it's, I mean, it worked, you know. They were being cheerfully obedient. They were listening to what God wanted them to do. Yeah, they were getting free food out of it. Yeah, I know sometimes they took way more food than they were supposed to. But they were in the presence of God. They were helping people out. They were doing what God called them to do, whether they realized it or not. And this little food pantry with a bunch of pirates and, and crackheads and, and kids that just needed community service because they, they beat up their mom or they, they, they robbed the car and took off with it, we fed... Two million pounds of food to over 10,000 families. Uh, we had 250 people every Saturday. We had seven, eight tables of bread every Saturday. It was an amazing ministry. And, and I was in charge of it. And that, that, that boggles my mind that God used me to help with the food pantry on that capacity. That, that's good, right? It was cool. It was great. It was great. Well... During all this going, that, that's enough, okay, it's, it's, it's for him, it's not for me. <laughs> During all this time, after about three years of doing the food pantry, the church is like, well, you've already got keys to the building, and you know where the light switches are. What, what the heck, let's make you the youth leader. I'm like, yeah, great, youth leader. That sounds fun. I've worked with kids before. <sighs> so, youth leader, and then they're like, well, we'll make you the children's director, too, because you're like the only young guy in the church. So, yeah, we'll, we'll make you that. Um, and we need, a, we need a drummer in our praise band, so I got to be drummer in the praise band, and suddenly they're like, well, maybe you should sing in the praise band. So, I don't know if that meant I was a bad drummer or not, but immediately I went back to drumming, so maybe it was a singing that... You guys are good at math. I know you can figure it out. Oh, by the way, I've got ADD. I don't know if you could tell. I don't think it's a math term, but... Uh, <laughs> So, so, so through my, 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 my chance to be a youth leader, I got to be a PE coach at two special needs schools. What? Oh, I used to be terrified of special needs kids, too, because I didn't know if they'd drool on me or if they'd smack me or something. Man, I tell you what, God humbled me immediately because I used to take my best buddy, I called him Honey Bear because it embarrassed him really good, uh, one, of, one of my best friends, man, I tell you what, uh, I had to take him to the bathroom. Every time this kid went to the bathroom his whole life, he had to have somebody take him to the bathroom pull his pants down, pull his pants back up. Do you have any idea how humbling that is? Yeah, it's awkward for me. I, you know, the, all of the, all the guidebooks as youth leaders say, do not take the kids into the bathroom. And I'm like, but I have to. And that, that's awkward. You know, a lot of youth pastors are kind of like, nope, nope, we're not going to deal with that. I also, I also had drug dealers in my youth group, and I had kids that I had to let go on smoke breaks. I had kids come in hungover. I had the kids that aren't supposed to be at church because church, church is for good people. I mean, you got to get there somehow, but, but, but there's, there's steps, you know, to get there. That's fine. So we, we had as kind of a, a misfit youth group, and we, we had lots of people at the church that, that scared people at the church. And that's understandable that, you know, if you have a, a beautiful social club, that you don't want scary people in your social club. So for whatever reason, eventually we ended up having to leave the church. My whole family, gone. 27 years, three, four generations in the church. We, we were politely asked it to, to move on to another spot. So we did. That was cool. I started working at Crosswinds. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with Crosswinds. That's a, it's like a foster, foster home type place, but it's government run. So is there anything else the government's running very well right now? I, I'm looking really hard. Um, so foster care, I don't really think should be run by the government. I think that this is a better area for foster care to be run. Because, you know, if we really want these kids to grow up to do something positive with their life, we have to give them positive examples, and we have to show them love. And the government's not really good at showing love, because church and state are separate whenever it, you know, it's good for the government. This is neat. Um, so, yeah, I got to work at Crosswinds for a while, and that, that was a fantastic job, man. I loved it. I got to work on my magic tricks, and I had all these kids that for some reason called me Pastor David, and that was really awesome, because I missed being a youth leader at that point. Um, Man, the foster care, dude, it's, oh, it's, it's so sad. We're, we're just, we're encouraging these kids that, like, look, the squeaky wheel obviously gets the grease. So if you throw a table at somebody, free laptop. And it's, it's sad, but this is, this is what goes on in these systems right now. So if, if you ever have an opportunity and, and you've got the availability to, to take a kid in, please do it. Please do it. They, we we got to get them out of these institutions. I mean, what happens to adults when, when they're in jail for five years? They, they can't get out of jail. Their, their mind is stuck in the institution. So what exactly do you think is going to happen to kids who are stuck in a facility for five, six years? So I learned something with kids. Something else I learned with kids, and this is really important, is that kids only have a 15-minute, 15 15-minute 15 
that, that you can talk to them, that they'll understand what you're saying. And, and, and I, I imagine that adults are worse. So what I need everyone to do is just, just as an intermission real quick and to show your cheerful obedience. I need everyone to stand up. Who knows Father Abraham? Awesome, we're going to learn it. Tell you what, I'll sing it first, but you guys have to do the hand motions, and I really want a nice loud chorus of people singing in a second. So it goes, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord bright on Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, Father Abraham, and many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot, Father Abraham, and many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right. That's enough. That's good. You guys did great. All right. Now with the kids, yeah. Now with the kids, normally we go right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, turn around, nod your head, don't throw up on the floor. So we're not going to do that today after a full breakfast. But you guys feel better after that. Now look, look, through that cheerful obedience, you, you know what happened just then? Everybody learned something. Father Abraham. That's good. Okay, good. So we learn through cheerful obedience, whether it's something we want to do or whether it's something God is just saying, you need to do this. The right attitude and, and, and listening, you gain a lot from it. There's no reason I should have had a food pantry. There's no reason I should have been a children's director or a youth leader. But God used me. I ended up with 35 kids some of which were special needs, some of which other youth groups wouldn't take in my youth group. I had a, a young adult group for like people my age, which was unheard of in our church. And we actually started our meetings by beating each other with fun noodles. That was, that was the pool noodle things, it was, it was great. That's the way to start some fellowship. Um, we, had, we had like 35 people. And you know what? We met in bars for our Bible study. And every time we met in a bar for our Bible study, we doubled. How about that? Interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the hymns actually came from old bar songs back when. Uh, people would go into the bars and they would rewrite the words from, from the tune of a bar song to church music. Crazy, huh? That, that's kind of neat. Um, oh, that, 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 uh, that Christo thing that I'm not, I'm not talking about. It's part of my story. I'm sorry. You can't, you can't talk about David Russell without Christo. I grew up in it since I was like their size. Little dude, like six years old, I was in the nursery singing this silly chicken song that some of you guys... Some of you guys are going to learn um, <laughs> if you want to eat. Um, I, I got to be in charge of one of these weekends. That's, that's a huge responsibility. I think I was the youngest rector or something, which is, you know, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just trying to let you guys know what God can do with you if you are cheerfully obedient. You just got to say yes. It's easy. We say yes to so many things that we shouldn't. It's great to say yes to something that we really need to. Um, I got to be a thrift store manager once. Holy cow, that was amazing. I swear to you, one day we went to a house, someone randomly called us, says, come pick up all this stuff. We picked up a bed and dress or whatever, and a fake leg. It was a brand new leg. And obviously I was gonna make a lamp out of it because I've seen Christmas Story. I kid you not, that Saturday, here comes in a gentleman on crutches, same legs missing. And I'm like, dude, oh, I got something for you. Hang on. Come here. Wait, I'll bring it to you. It's cool. It's cool. I got it. I got it. Come running over to him. It cut at the same spot. The only difference was he needed a bigger foot on it. And this is a $20,000 piece of equipment. This guy never came to the thrift store before. He says, you know, I wasn't even coming here. I was going straight over to Merritt Island. And something just said, nah, just stop at that thrift store you've never seen before, never been into before, and have no interest in going into. And dude got a $20,000 leg out of it. And I have an awesome witness to talk about because this guy was cheerfully obedient when he needed to be. Um, <laughs> I used to hang out at sex offender camps. Part of my food pantry thing is, man, I got to feed people. I used to go into the camps. Now, this is, this is another sad situation, kind of like foster care. Here's these guys that out of jail, uh, wh whether, whether they, they really did something that, that they deserve to have an ankle monitor or whether their girlfriend was 17 and they were 18 and the mom got real mad about it. These guys, ankle bracelet. They got to check in at certain times all the time. They have to live in this certain spot that their ID says. IDs are like 50, 60 bucks at this point. Now, certain members of society kept coming in and rushing them out of their place. So every time they were forced to move, that's $50 for an ID. That's going down and re-registering where your ankle bracelet is. Now, if you're homeless and you're just out on the streets, 
Where are you going to get 50 bucks from every time that you need to move because you were forcefully moved out of your place? Oh, and did I mention they also had to pay for the generator to charge their ankle bracelets because if their ankle bracelets died on them just once, they're right back in jail? How, how, do, you, how do you do better for yourself with that? That's, that's rough. Yeah, government. All right, cool. Um, Used to go hang out with them, and, and man, I'll tell you what, before I had a daughter, it was, it was, it was a lot easier to do. Now I'd, I'd have to think maybe twice about it, but man, just these guys out here, and these, these are normal people. A lot of homeless people in our area are just normal people who miss one paycheck. I, I could be homeless if I miss one paycheck. One paycheck. That's scary. Not, like, people my age, that I, don't, I don't know anybody that I graduated from high school that is better than one paycheck away from being on the streets. Even my boss, which, which is crazy. I do construction work right now. Uh, I'm in between, you know, ministry jobs. I'm always ministering as much as I can. Every, every opportunity I get, um, I, 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 we, we pray at lunch. We're a construction crew that play, prays at lunch. That's pretty impressive, I think. My, <laughs> my boss is getting baptized tomorrow. What? That's awesome. Way to go, Travis. Way to go, man. That's, that's cool. And, and like three, four months ago, he didn't go to church. I'm just like, hey, you want to go on this mission trip with us? We're going to go up to Tennessee, and we're going to have like 35 kids with us, and we're just going to go play in the snow for a weekend. It'll be easy. Eat some food and play in the snow. And we get up there after 700 miles on a bus together uh, and very few bathroom breaks because we'll, we'll, we'll use the cabin when we get there. Um, all the plumbing was frozen in the entire resort. So you're talking like 100 cabins with no bathrooms? Woo-hoo-hoo! That was fun. Travis sure was happy he went on that with us. And, and the funny thing is he really, he really was. He was happy to bang on these pipes and, and use the ladies' hair dryers to unclog. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. We'll, we'll get you guys some new hair dryers. It's okay. Um, but, but through being cheerfully obedient, now my boss is getting baptized. He's, he's coming into the family, and it's, it's just awesome to actually be able to see that happen. There, there were times when I had a lot of friends that were coming to church, and unfortunately, the politics of the church chased them off. That, 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 that sucks. <laughs> I finally got a buddy who, you know, and I really didn't do as much for him as I had for other people, and now, you know, he's, he's more involved in the church than I am. He's in the praise band, and he's in two or three small groups, and he's there every Sunday, and right on, man. That, that's encouraging to me. Um, so now that we're all friends and you guys kind of know who I am and, and what God's done with me so far. That's the wrong one. I should really number these things better. Ha ha! Yep, there it is. Now we're new friends. ADD. Cool. So this is about relationship. Churches can't be about religion because it's not working. This, this is communion. Not, not a little cardboard piece. Yes, it, it symbolizes communion. And I appreciate what we do for shrinking it down for a church service. For, for those that can't be here, obviously, like the ladies, because it's a men's breakfast. But this, this is what communion is supposed to be about. And why is this about? Because we need to see how people eat with their mouths open and how they got that little piece of bacon on the side of their mouth there. Uh, you, you, you need to see the imperfections in people. And you can't do that in a two-second communion thing. Spill, you got to see them spill their coffee, and who's going to help them clean it up? You know, who, who's going to actually get up out their seat, get out their comfort zone, get a mop, and who's actually going to help out? You know, we, we got to start getting out of our comfort zones. It's important, man. You get comfortable, and it's the same thing. You get into that routine. Nothing's going to change. So, so, so cheerful obedience and comfort zones, I guess, are two of the biggest things that I'm here to talk about. Um, anyone in here talk to God? I'm sure everyone in here prays. Does anyone in here hear God talking back to them? Now, does anyone actually just hear God like, David, don't do that? I'm sure it's not David, except for like, well, no, half of you guys in here are Davids, I learned this morning. Um, God talks to me through birds. Birds? What do you mean birds? Birds. That's right. Who in here has ever seen a roseate spoonbill? It's a bright pink bird. It lives in Florida with us. Now, those of you who have seen them know just how beautiful they are and how obvious they are against the green backgrounds. Now, those of you who have never seen them, what are you looking at? I don't get it. They're everywhere, just like God. But if you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know that they're a shallow wading bird and they want to be in the shallow ditches that are alkaline just a little bit so they can get those fishes they really like, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're totally going to miss them. I've seen them in the, in the ditch on the side of the road. But generally when I see them, I'm, I'm asking God, what am I supposed to do? What am I doing here? What, am I doing this correctly? Boom, pink bird. I'm like, all right, God, thank you. I needed that. I needed that so badly. God talks to me through my brothers. You know how I knew I was going to be a youth leader? It's because of the lady in church that I loathed. 
came up to me and said, I had a dream about you last night. And you're going to be a youth leader. And I just needed to tell you that. And now that was it. Now, the lady that me and we butted heads because obviously I was a pirate and her son liked me and we, we, we shouldn't have hung out. So she didn't like me. And if, if God put it on her heart uncomfortably that she needed to come and tell me cheerfully, obediently, well, you know, obediently, that I was going to be a youth leader, I better listen because God is really trying to tell me something here. So God, God will talk to us, but we really need to learn what we're looking for. If you could totally miss them. If I drive down the highway to go to Orlando, I see turkeys and and. and, and deer and stuff on the side of the road all the time, but it's because I know what I'm looking for. Most people just see the reflectors, the little bumps on the side of the road. It's okay. Um, you know, we, we have to be together. We, we have to spend time together. we got to spill coffee together. Uh, one of my favorite analogies is if you have a big fire and you, you take one of these big logs that's on fire and you take it and you set it over here, what's going to happen? It's going to go out. What happens as soon as you take said log and you stick it back on the fire? <laughs> That's like us. No matter how strong a Christian you are, you need fellowship. If Jesus needed brothers to keep us straight, so do we. Yeah. I didn't even write that one down, Bob. That's good. <laughs> we have to make a friend, we have to be a friend, and then we can bring people to Christ. That's why I wanted to tell you everything on these two pages. Y'all don't know me. I'm just some kid that obviously can't dress himself in the morning anymore. My poor daughter. Imagine what she goes like to... Anyway... Now that you guys know me, I can get to the heart of the issue. I can actually talk to you guys a little bit. I can let you guys know what God has shared with me. You know, we're all different parts of the body. Not all of us do the same thing. Just, just because, you know, you like to, like, dunk people fully underwater, and I just like to hit them with a little bit of water, baptism's baptism. We don't do it all the same. That's not the important part. We can't get wrapped up on the religion side of it. It's about relationship. Where is your heart when you get baptized? You know, I, I love my wife. My daughter loves my wife. My in-laws love my wife. All the kids, special needs kids that my wife teaches love my wife. But we all have totally different relationships. None of them will ever love my wife the same way that I do. I'll never love my wife the same way my daughter does. And it's the same way with God. Just because my relationship with God doesn't line up with Jim's here, I mean, it's, 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 but it's, it's a little bit different. Mine's got more hair. Um, it doesn't make it any less valid. Um, we we got to serve each other. Church service. It's neat how it's called church service. How many of us are actually getting in there and serving? Who's in there just to soak up the AC and the free, you know, chips and juice? Oh, I thought he had his hand up. He's got a camera. <laughs> well, he's the sound guy. He's definitely serving. You know what I mean? <sighs> so so it's, it's kind of like, what are you waiting for to serve? Do you need someone to come out to you and say, hey, come up here and do this? No, we're not. It's in the Bible. God gave us authority to do anything that he asks us to do. Why do we need anybody else's permission? Paul didn't have to ask anybody to bring this freak up here to talk to y'all. Paul said, well, God said I need to bring him up here. And I said, well, if Paul says I need to be up here, I mean, he's obviously crazy. But I'll listen. Out of my comfort zone. We have to be judgment free. We can't, we can't be judging people. We can't. You know how many opportunities I would have missed out on in my food pantry if I judged people? In fact, no, there was the one time I judged somebody. This guy pulled up in a brand new Miata, like a 2002 Miata. It was, it was a while ago. Okay. You, you were like two. That's cool. <laughs> it was a brand new Miata this guy pulled up in every week. And he'd come in and he'd get his bags of food. He'd sign for him and out the door he'd go. And I was just one day, look, dude, you know, me and my friends work really hard up here. And we stock these shelves. And you come in with your new car and you get all this food. And I, I just don't think it's right. He's like, sir, I'm very sorry. Uh, my, my, my neighbor just got out the, the hospital with cancer, so I was, I was taking it to her. Ten minutes later, he's back up there with the lady. I never asked again. It is not my job to judge. If God brings somebody before me, it's not my job to judge. It's my job to serve. And it's your job, too. You guys signed up for it. Great commission. we got to be witnesses to people. we got to serve people. Matthew, I don't know, like 25-ish, talks about sheep and the goats. And it's, it's, it's you, you got to clothe the naked, and you got to visit those in jails and in hospitals. And, and you know, you got to take care of the orphans and the widows and stuff. And I took this on. I'm like, okay, we got to get a food pantry going. We need to go work at a foster care place. i gotta got to hug all my ladies at church. Ooh, those hugs are great, too. I tell you what, that's the other reason I come to church for the fellowship. you got to have fellowship you got to have somebody else out there that's going through a rough time and smiling at you. You know, how many times do we go into church and, hey, how are you doing this week? Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just fine. Everything, everything's fine. And you can tell that they are trying so hard to hold back the tears right there. we got to get beyond that. 
another reason Christo is great, because it puts us in small groups. A lot of churches are starting to catch on to this small group thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with a mega church. That's great. you got so many people coming to fellowship. It's like a football game every time you go. And that's great. We should be worshiping other things like football that are not football. That's fine. But you also need to be able to connect to somebody in that church. You need a small group of guys, a small group of people that, that, that can fellowship with you and can tell you how their week's going. You need some people you can encourage and also receive encouragement from. It's, it's, it's so important. Jesus needed it. We need it. It's simple. Simple. So God's uh, he's, he's laid some things on my heart. I, I know there's some things that I'm supposed to do. One of them is start a kayaking ministry for kids. We got all these kids in foster care. I love kayaking. I love talking about birds. There's simple Bible lessons out there. I already, I already pulled one with you with the pink bird. If you, if you know how to find God, you'll find him. There's a pink bird. All right, great. Now we can go back to kayaking. Um, I started this little thing down in Cogo Village. Uh, I just started putting it out on, on the Facebook. As my in-laws like to call it, the Facebook. They're so, they're so hip. I love them. Um, Saturday morning, we just go down to Cogo Village Park, and I started singing some songs, and 30 people showed up to the first one. What? 30 people showed up to hear me talk, and they knew me. <laughs> I had to stop it right now because I'm, I'm on this Christo Weekend thing coming up, and, and doesn't it figure that the day that my boss, my boss of all people, finally says, hey, you really need to start this thing, make a date for it, the day I decided, Saturday mornings at 1030, I get a phone call from the next rector saying, hey, I need you to meet me down here in this church way out on Satellite Beach. On, on Saturday morning is 8.30, so I'm like, oh, great. I guess I'll cancel this for a little while. So it's going to be starting back up soon. It'll be Saturday morning, about mm, 10.30, down in Cocoa Village. We're going to go down there. We're going to sing in front of people. I know we're getting outside of our, our, our prison walls here, and we're actually going out to people who don't know Jesus because it's kind of the whole point. It's great that, like, you know, this is like boot camp. If you're brand new to church, go to church. Be in church. Get all you can from it. But don't just leave it there. Monday morning comes, you get out and you tell people what you learn in church. All the way to Friday, Saturday. I got a yard ministry thing in mind, too. You know how hard it is. You get you a can of orange spray paint and you go to some little old ladies. Listen, let's face it. Two things that Florida has more of than probably anywhere else is fast-growing vegetation. Retired folks that maybe not be able to take care of their vegetation. So you get out there with an orange can of spray paint and you go on a couple, a couple branches, you go back behind it, you snap them off, and then you get kids, child labor is okay in church, and you get them to haul it to the side of the road for you. Done! Easy project, done in two hours. Imagine the impact you're making, not only on the homeowner that you're helping, but also all the neighbors around that are watching this go down, man. This is impactful. We got to do something about foster care, too, still. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy with the way foster care works right now. It, it hurts to see it. I, I saw so many things when I was working at Crosswinds that just as a Christian, really hurt me. You know, they're numbers. The kids are numbers. They're dollar signs, which, you know, rightfully so. It's got to be a business, just like church, you know. Unfortunately, we have to kind of see dollar signs to keep these bright lights in people's faces. It's, it's unfortunately, it's the side of the church that we have to deal with as long as you have a building. But if you do something in Cocoa Village with no building, you don't, you don't literally need any funding at all. It's all free. God's already made a nice amphitheater out there for us, beautiful scenery, and people that can hear you. You know, I mean, I can scream into this thing as loud as, like this. <gasps> no, I won't do that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I can scream into this microphone as loud as I want to. Maybe, maybe someone on the other side of the fence might hear it for a second, you know. And then, and then it's, it's just back in this room and all of you guys are like, ah, why do you do that? There's another part in here. I got a song if I could find it. It's good. Social media. I'm impressed, man. I ain't seen you pull your phone out the entire time. I really appreciate that. I'm serious. That's not even a joke. Who in here has checked their phone while I've been up here talking? Own up to it. Brian. I knew it. I knew it was Brian. I didn't even have to look. I love Brian. He's good people. Social media is killing our kids right now. When I was a youth leader, I had kids that would be like, he'd be over here texting to this one right over here. And I'm like, I don't care that you guys talk while I'm doing my lesson, but talk to each other. This, this, you don't learn anything out of a text message. You know how many times like, I've accidentally thrown an apostrophe at the end of my text message to my wife and I came home to a screaming match? I was like, that was supposed to be a period. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, things get so misconstrued. And, and again, it's, we don't get to see the spilled coffee cups when, when all you're doing is texting. When all you're doing is looking at your friends on Facebook. Again, everybody's just fine. Oh, we're fine. 30 likes. Oh, we're doing good. 30 likes. And that kids are missing out on body language. 
We're, we're missing out on actual interaction with people. We're missing out on how bad dude stinks without his deodorant. We're missing out on the positives and the negatives of personal interaction right now, and it's very scary. Um, you know, I think there's a song that really, it really kind of sums up kids nowadays, and it's from Little Mermaid, but because I left my Little Mermaid voice at home, um, I can only do DMX, so, so we'll try it out. It's like, look at this stuff, isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the girl, the girl who has everything? I got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want to think I'm the babs? I got 20, but who cares? No big deal. I want more. Clap a little bit. That was good. That was good. Okay, that's enough. That's good. Okay. Kids are focused on themselves right now because that's what we've taught them. We've taught them that we are the most important things in the world iPods, iTunes, you know, you got, you got, you got MySpace, you know what I mean? It's all about me. I don't care about you. It's about me. Am I right? You know this to be true. Back me up, dude. People are looking at me. Come on, man. Don't put me up here like that. <laughs> Am I close to my half hour yet? Did I go way, way over? I knew it. Guys, thank you for listening to me today. I appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. Remember, I'm a shy dude. You may not believe it. I am a shy person. And God can do amazing things with me just because I'm obedient. Do the same, guys. Y'all have a, a, a happy Easter and remember what it's about, okay? I love you guys. Thank you very much. Hard, hard act to follow. We're gonna have to find somebody, you know, next next month that's, you know, not quite so shy, a little more outspoken, you know, get to the point already. Um, would anyone like? Oh, thank you so much for the the breakfast crew. Thank you so much. Somebody said. Uh, somebody asked me at some point in the week. Hey, do you think they could, you know, put a little less spice in the in the gravy or something? I said, are you nuts? What is your problem? Anyway, would anyone like to close us out, please? It, it's Easter weekend, somebody, okay, right back here, please. Father, we just thank you so much. Father, we thank you for the speaker that we had today, Lord, and because it is about relationship, it is not about religion. Father, you went to that cross so that we could all have a relationship with you. Father, you have opened the doors. You have beat death. The victory is now ours through you. And Father, we pray that as we go back to our churches today, Lord God, and as we sit in those pews, in those chairs tomorrow, Father, that the Spirit of God will pour down upon us. And Father, we will truly appreciate the sacrifice that you made so that we may live. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Yeah. All right. See y'all next week or next month. <laughs> <laughs>